Well, good morning, church. How are we doing today? It's live in here. Here we go. Hey, it's so great to see everyone. Uh, I, I saw several new people today, people that, that had uh, maybe visited and come back. I just want to let you know we're really glad that you're here. So welcome back to church. Maybe it's your first time in a long time or first time ever. We're really glad to see you today. Uh, today is going to be fun because um, it's our all-together summer su- celebration Sunday, so uh, right after service here. Uh, actually, you probably already saw and smelled everything happening out front. It could get more difficult as we go. Usually the longer I preach, the better the food smells. And when I feel like when people start sneaking out, then I'll know it's time to close. Um, but right after service today, we have a baptism, uh, and we're super excited about that. I'll give you some instructions at the end of service. And then also we're going to share in some fellowship, some food, which has been a long time since we've done that. And I'm really looking forward to celebrating that with you today. I want to say good morning or, or whenever you happen to be seeing the service. I want to welcome everyone watching online uh, today. We love you. Uh, for those that can't be with us and want to be with us, we wish you could be here. We miss you. We're thinking about you. We're praying for you. Even though if we don't see you, we still know you're there and, and know that you're part of our church. And so we're really glad that you're here all gathered together. This uh, next couple of weeks are, represent kind of a whole a new startup time for us here at LifeHouse in terms of our fall season and what we call our fall kickoff time. And a couple of things happen when we get to fall kickoff. Um, number one, we usually get into a whole new, you know, fresh teaching uh, series for the fall, something that's sure to, to really minister to all of us and uh, especially to those who maybe don't have a church to belong to or looking for someone to come in, uh, you know, a church to come in that can be part of. Um, is, but another thing that happens is really our, our discipleship and our small group um, activities begin to kick back off again in the fall. In fact, beginning the week of September 6th, and specifically midweek kicks off September 8th, our discipleship will be back into full swing. If you didn't notice last week, because we, we kind of started letting you know about this last week, on your way out, and this will be easy because you can like grab one while you're you're sitting down to a meal. You can find our life group catalogs. They're right outside the door there. There's a place where you can sign up and say, hey, here's where I'm going to plug in for small group. And uh, this is always such an important thing for us to consider. Now, when Jesus gave a great commission, he's like, you know, go into all the world and make disciples. You know, there's actually an assumption there. And that is that we are already being discipled ourselves, right? That we're engaged at. It's not like a job we've been given to do that maybe the pastor and some other people are going to take care of while we kind of ride along. No, the idea is that we are disciple-making disciples. We are engaged in discipleship. And so uh, I really want to encourage you. I, I really wish I could just stay completely positive and just, you know, hoorah, let's go and let's, be, let's get involved and then, and then think everyone's going to show up. But I know what happens. We find excuses we have all kinds of other things that come in the way. Well, I'm kind of busy. There's a lot going on. The kids are here and the kids are there. And ah, I've got a lot of extra work to do. I've got some things I want to get done this fall. And I know what happens. All kinds of things bubble to the surface. And they become priorities and conflicts and all of these other things. I want to really challenge you, church. Make this a season where you pluck the excuses out of your life. And you let the priority of following Jesus rise to the top in your life. Could we just see something different happen? Come on, somebody. I'm ready to follow Christ with those that are hungry to follow Christ. And so now many of you are already connected to small groups. I'm so glad for that. But if you're here this morning and you, you don't even know what a small group is, you, you'd have a hard time trying to describe one maybe. The small groups are this, uh, or really it's a, a place we create, an environment we create, where smaller groups of people get together outside of Sunday mornings to really connect and disciple and study God's word, and better still, to encourage one another, to help one another, to pray for one another. Because how many of you need a friend praying for you these days, right? And it is such an important thing to not only our individual growth and health and spiritual walk, but to that collectively of the body of Christ. Come on, somebody. And so I want to encourage you with a strong pastoral encouragement to get engaged in the small groups this fall. I, I, I don't believe you'll regret it. Yes, sometimes we're like, oh man, I, you know, the commitment sometimes feels like a lot, but I'm telling you what, it is always well worth the growth. I've said this many times over the years. 
any time I have grown significantly as a follower of Jesus, it has always been within the context of a small group of people who come together and we got into God's Word. That is when growth really happens. So this fall, there's all kinds of great ways you could do that, several places to plug in. So check it out, get involved, sign up. If you're like, Pastor, I have no idea where to get involved, then come talk to me. I'll help you figure that out. We'll, we'll introduce you to some people, see where you fit, because God has a place for you. Um, with that, um, also, uh, our, our kids a crew, the night crew is going to be kicking back off on midweek. How many of you love our kids? They're awesome. And that's going to be a lot of fun. And then also, our student ministry will be gathering back together. And, uh, and I'm going to let you watch this short little announcement right from our student ministry department. Fall semester youth group is about to begin, and we want you to be part of the fun. For students in the 6th through 12th grades, youth group provides the important time to grow in your relationship with God. For all our incoming 6th graders and those who will be joining us for the first time, we cannot wait for you to be part of what we are doing this fall. From games and fun to worship and prayer, youth group is a way to make friends, memories, and a deeper faith. This year, we will be exploring the topic of unity. Join us Wednesday nights as we dive deeper into what it means to be one. We are so excited to see what God will do through this new series. Outside of Wednesday nights, there's so much more we will be doing this semester. Events such as fall conference, outreach nights, and celebrations together are some of the fun times we have that you don't want to miss. As we start out this new year this fall, we want more students to come. If you know a friend or someone who needs somewhere to go on Wednesday or is looking for a youth group, invite them to come with you. We don't want anyone to miss this. Youth Group kicks off Wednesday, September 8th at 7 p.m. and will continue each Wednesday night. We cannot wait to see you there. Yeah, let's give our students a hand. Fun. Uh, I also got to take a moment and brag because uh, there's been a lot of good things going on this summer. One of those, uh, Tori, is she, she in here? Oh, she's right back there, yeah. Uh, she, she led this summer um, an internship with some of our, of our, of our high school students for um, creative arts, and we actually, over this, over this last several, over the summer, they actually came together every week, learned how to use some of the video editing software and some of the graphic design software used, and actually, they've been involved in making the videos that we've had every, every week. That one was all students right there. Can we give them a hand? Because that was pretty awesome. And uh, so, uh, well done, all of the kids that were involved in that. Uh, we love investing in our young people here. And uh, I'm excited for the generation God's raising up and the gifts and skills he's given them. They, they figured out like in a couple of weeks what it's taken me like 10 years to sort of figure out. So they're awesome and, and I can't wait to see more of the creative energy spent for God and his kingdom. So anyway, good stuff happening this fall. I can't wait to see you there. Well, uh, a few weeks ago, uh, four weeks ago to be precise, we kicked off a series called Dry Seasons. And today... We're going to kind of put a pin in that today and wrap up this morning, but we've said along the way that dry seasons are really just a reality of our lives, especially if we think about them, and I'm speaking specifically in the context of spiritual dry seasons. Some of you are like, well, I know dry seasons, like, you know, I've had financial dry seasons, I've had marriage dry seasons, I mean, you know all kinds of dry seasons, but today I'm really focusing in on those spiritual dry seasons that sometimes we find ourselves in, Right? And, um, and there are just times in our life, and our walk with Christ, if we've done it for any length of time, where we feel a little dry. Come on, somebody. It's, it's okay to be honest. It's okay to be real. Uh, it's just the reality of it um, that we all experience. And, and in admitting this, right, our, our goal is not to, like, kind of wallow around in it and, like, you know, you know, have pity parties together. My hope in going to this series is, number one, I want to encourage those of you that feel like you're there, that you've been in the midst of it, and you're not even sure how to move out of it, move beyond it. But I also think that one of the best strategies in life to things we know are going to happen inevitably is we prepare ourselves for those seasons. So knowing that a dry season, it could be just around the corner, my hope is that we feel equipped and we feel readied and like, okay, we've thought about it, we've prayed about it. I have something now in my heart to draw from when I hit that season. I won't feel maybe stuck or alone. I'll at least have some fundamentals to know Here's, here's what I need to look to. Here's where I need to go and who I need to count on. Of course, the answer in all of that is Christ. Can I get an amen to that? 
but we want to be ready, and, and so that's part of what we wanted to accomplish. Um, I want to also say I, I'm very grateful the past couple of weeks that you probably know I've been out. Some people are going, I didn't even notice. <laughs> that's okay. It's all right. I'm hard to miss, but, you know, I, it, it, you, it's, I completely get it because we had phenomenal um, pulpit fill speakers uh, the last couple of weeks. Uh, I want to give a shout out to John Weber who brought an awesome word about coming in off that front porch. Um, about, what it, about the role that community plays, this covenant community God's put it is, put us in and how important it is to cling to that in these times. I want to thank Pastor Crane DeHamer who brought an awesome word last week um, about, about uh, collecting our strength and that Jesus is there just for just that, that reason, right? And we want to lean into him and we want to lay things at his feet and take up his burden and let him refresh us. It's such great words and I'm so grateful that... Um, that we had some had good encouragement while, while I was away. But today we're going to wrap up, and I want to kind of talk about this hope and truth that while we might find ourselves in these desert experiences of sort, there is something I want us to count on together, something I want to encourage you to look to. And, and it has to do with the nature and, and, and the very character of our God, and, and it's this right here. Our God is the God who brings rivers to deserts. Come on. Our God is a God, the kind of God who brings rivers to deserts. And that's what I want to talk about today. Again, dry seasons are to be expected. I, 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 we've mentioned it every week, but I want to really make sure that we have it down. We need to expect. We need to be aware of. We need to be prepared for. Make ourselves ready for the dry seasons that will inevitably come to life. Christ nowhere promised uh, that you know, we would always feel him. He didn't promise the ground is always going to shake when we pray or, in, or that every experience is going to feel like we're on top of the mountain. That promise was never made to us. Any preacher selling you that is selling you spiritual snake oil, right? The, but here's what Jesus did say, right? Remember this, John 16, 33? Here on earth, you're going to have many troubles, Right? We're, we're going to have that experience, but he has overcome the world. So we can take courage and, and trust in that. But we're going to have trouble. And there's times in our lives where it feels like all we need is a little spiritual Gatorade, right? Yeah, you know, I'm doing pretty good. I'm, I'm in pretty good shape. Things are going pretty well. I, I just need a, a, little, a little something, right, to kind of move me into the second half of the game. We have those moments where like, well, that's all I feel like I need, a little spiritual Gatorade. But then there's other times... <laughs> We feel like we're the person who got lost in the desert for a week and has got to be hooked to an IV just to bring us back to life. I mean, there are those moments where we feel that we're that far gone. But I want to tell you this, and you might be here and you might feel that way right now, that when you find yourself in that situation, no spiritual Gatorade is going to fix you at all. What we need is, 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 is something that I think we can bring out of our text this morning and we're going to find that God is actually offering something greater than Gatorade. He is offering a steady stream of crystal clear, clean, spiritual rejuvenation right into our veins. That's what he wants to offer us, bringing us life that revives us. Now, how do we know that? Well, we know that because our God has left us a lot of insight into his character. He's given us his word. He's, through the experiences of his people in history, we get a good picture of his nature and how much he loves his kids the extraordinary things that he has in mind for you and for me. And, and here's the crazy thing about our God, is that he has all these good things in mind for us and in store for us, even while we're off running the other direction. Even when we are being disobedient, even when we're far from him in a, a distant land, so to speak, he still has the best of intentions for you and I. And so we want to come to him because he's the source of all the life and refreshing and reviving that we need. So I'm going to share a passage here today that I think we can draw from, and I'm, then I want to give you some background and context to consider it more deeply. But if you have your Bibles with me, turn with me to Isaiah chapter 43, and I want to pick up actually in verse 18, and we're going to, we'll take a couple of looks in Isaiah, but then I have several other passages I'm going to scare. I hope the Bible reading that doesn't bother you. I kind of, we're kind of big on that here, so hopefully you'll be okay with that. Take notes today. I'm going to share with you in just a little bit five things that we can do or we should do when we know or believe that we are in a dry season. And we're going to come to that in just a little bit. But Isaiah 43 verse 18 says this. 
But forget all that. It is nothing compared to what I am going to do. For I am about to do something new. See, I've already begun. Do you not see it? I will make a pathway through the wilderness. I will create rivers in the dry wasteland. The wild animals in the fields will thank me, and the jackals and owls too, for giving them water in the desert. Yes, I will make rivers in the dry wasteland so my chosen people can be, say it with me, refreshed. I've made it Israel for myself, and they will someday honor me before the whole world. Amen. Our God is the God who brings rivers to the desert. The text, I think, really is a fantastic encouragement from our God of the hope, renewal, and restoration that he brings. Now, I want to be clear, this, these words we just read were spoken to a specific people at a specific time in a specific place, and we don't ever want to lose sight of the context uh, that, is, that is here. But, but again, I think what's so precious about this is it reveals the heart of his father towards his kids, towards those he's in covenant relationship, those that he has, as he has claimed for his own, and we are his chosen people. The title of the book, a little bit about Isaiah, well, the title of the book Isaiah is obviously named after the human uh, prophet, the author who, under the whole inspiration of the Holy Spirit, you know, wrote it together. Interestingly, the name of Isaiah uh, in, the, in the Hebrew means Yahweh is salvation. That's fairly appropriate, isn't it? Because, and actually, that is an excellent summary of the entire book of Isaiah, if you've not studied it from bow to stern. But Isaiah is a prophet who lived in Jerusalem in the, in the latter uh, half of Israel's kingdom period, and he spoke on behalf of God to the leaders of Jerusalem and Judea. And when you look at Isaiah, it's really kind of divided into two major sections. In fact, some have even likened Isaiah to being almost like a mini Bible because there's 66 chapters in Isaiah, there's 66 bi- uh, verses in your Bible, and, and, um, and when you look at the first uh, chapter, first few chapters, uh, chapters 1 through 39, really contains God's denunciation of Israel and Judah and then the other many other wicked nations around them. You look at the Old Testament, really it's, it's an outcry against the wickedness uh, of mankind and dealing with basically wicked and, and adulterous, you know, mankind. We see this here. Um, and Isaiah warned of God's judgment in this first half. He he, he warned Israel's corrupt leaders that, look, your rebellion to God is eventually going to catch up with you. It's going to come at a cost. You keep pressing on, but if you keep pushing on, here's what's going to happen. Here's what God will bring your way in order to bring you to a place that he can uh, fulfill his promises in you once again. In fact, God even said that he would use enemy nations like Assyria and Babylon to judge Jerusalem if they persisted in their idolatry and oppression and neglect of the poor. And in the midst of this first, you know, portion of Isaiah, there's also this mix of hope that we see in here because Isaiah still firmly believed this, that, that even though this was this, this, this pronouncement of judgment that would come, he still knew and believed that, uh, that God would fulfill his covenant promises, that he still would, from the line of David, establish his kingdom um, and, that, you know, and that at the end of the day, he, this, this king would uh, lead Israel into obedience and to a faithful, loving uh, covenant with God that they would all fulfill the promises that were given from God to Abraham. He, he believed this, and so there's, there's a, a mix of hope that's in there. But then also, in the, when we get to the latter part, we, chapters 40 through 66, we really see the pickup of this message of hope in the same way that when we come to the New Testament, we really have the beautiful picture of hope realized, right? And we see this coming together. And, um, and Isaiah, he's often been called the evangelical prophet because he says more about the coming and redemptive work of the Messiah than any other book in the Old Testament. It's, it's really an amazing book to read. But sadly, by the time we get to the end of chapter 39, this, um, this uh, judgment that God promised had, and the pronunciations of judgment, they, they would come to pass. And the people would indeed suffer defeat. They would indeed experience loss, exile, captivity, enslavement. Um, their homelands would be brought to utter desolation. And this exile would lead to a long season of hardship and trial and difficulty for God's people. And, and in fact, God would, would liken it to a purifying fire. 
a kind of purifying fire that would come along and burn the whole tree down just to a smoldering stump. But yet somehow that stump would become the seed of promise for his, for his people. And it's out of this, so this you know, uh, by the time we get to about chapter 40, and as we lead into chapter 43, uh, w- this whole season is coming to a close. And um, the nation of Israel has been sufficiently chastised for their many sins. And the tone is really shifting now to hope and freedom. And in chapter 43, which we opened with a moment ago, God reassures his nation of Israel that he is with them and that he will protect her as he draws her out of Babylonian captivity back to her home. But this won't be like the exodus of the old days. It's going to be more epic than even the great deliverance we we know about as, as they escaped from Pharaoh and his army in the Red Sea and the sea swallows them up. It'll be even a more epic deliverance than that. And it's going to be a new thing, both literally and figuratively. Just look back at this, Isaiah 43, again, verse 18 and 21. But forget all that. He's referencing, again, these great deliverances that they spoke of in the past. He says, it's nothing compared to what I'm going to do. For I'm about to do something new. See, I have already begun. Do you not see it? I'll make a pathway through the wilderness. I will create rivers in the dry wasteland. Uh, commentator Jeffrey Grogan said that the God of the Exodus now asserts the wonderful freshness of his new act and prospect. He had made a way through the waters. Now he'll make a way through the desert. Water, formerly a barrier, will now be a blessing with God as its source. In fact, it's going to be, and what God spoke to his people, it's going to be such a great time. It's going to be such a refreshment, such a restoration Then in verse 20, he goes on to say, the wild animals in the field are going to thank me. It's going to be that good. The animals are going to be giving up praise. And the jackals and owls too, for giving them water in the desert. Yes, I'll make rivers in the dry wasteland so that my chosen people can be refreshed. And, And God's people had indeed endured one very long dry season. 70 years is a pretty good uh, dry season. How many of you would agree, right? That's a long dry season. Uh, and and you know, keep that in perspective when we complain about the rough week we had, you know, the, or the, the sermon didn't really land with us today. <laughs> it was really dry. Here, you know, worship didn't really hit the right note for me. Uh, you know, or, well, you know, I read my Bible. I don't remember anything about it today. No, th- 70 years is a long dry season. Let's keep that in perspective. But we too, like these people of old, certainly can relate, at least in our own context, our own realities, a feeling at times of being beaten down or weary or frustrated in these certain seasons. And it might be because of our sin, maybe, maybe like uh, God's people of old, maybe sin is the very thing that has taken us into a very dry and empty place, and if so, we need to deal with that. We're going to talk more about that in just a little bit. But because our God is who he is, no matter what the cause, and we do need to understand time, sometimes dry seasons just happen, happen for all sorts of reasons. God may lead us into them. We may have put ourselves in them. There's all kinds of things that go on. But no matter what the cause, we need to hold on to the fact that our God is the God of redemption and restoration. Come on. Some of you need encouragement in that today because you've been beat up. You've been beat down. Life has come at you pretty hard. You've taken some things. It's been dishing out. It's been dishing out. And all you feel is like kind of empty, dry, beat up, beat down. You wonder. You get up and wonder whether God even loves you. You struggle with prayer because you're like, I don't know that he's listening. You've been there. But I want to tell you this. No matter what you've been through, what you're coming through, what you're going in, you serve the God of redemption. He writes redemption stories. He doesn't write cancellation stories. Our God writes redemption stories, and not only does he write redemption stories, he writes stories of restoration, right? And, and I, that should be an encouragement for some of us today that are really struggling and really in a difficult place, redemption and restoration. And because God is the God of redemption, we have faith that when we go through dry seasons and we come through them, they're not to make us feel bad. They're not, they're not to take us there to a place of, uh, of some sort of punishment. But instead, we know that God uses all these things to help us grow and change us into more mature followers of Christ. You know, those, I don't know if we have any farmers in the room today. If we do, praise God for you. Thank you for the job that you do. 
but a farmer can well understand this whole idea of, of, of what it is to till or plow, right? It, it, we, the, the goal is to break up the ground, prepare the soil for new planting and a healthier harvest. But how many of you know this? When you break that field up, it doesn't look so good. It's a mess. It's tore up. It's, it looks barren. It's dead. But, it, but what appears to be broken and dead and torn up is actually a precursor to new life and new growth. And, and our dry seasons, they may leave us at a place, they may find us at a moment where we feel parched, where we feel dried up, where we feel torn up, broken up, as if maybe, you know, all life is gone. It just feels ugly and lifeless and dead in us. But I tell you what, even in the midst of there, even in that moment, God is often preparing our hearts for his work to be done in them. And that's something we can trust him for. And one of the great keys, of course, is to recognize that whenever our next season of refreshment comes, it can only be found by drinking deeply from the living water that Christ alone can offer. You won't find any other source that's going to revive your soul other than Jesus Christ. So what do we do when we're in a dry season, when we find ourselves there? And, and I want to tell you this, it takes some intentionality, right? We can't just wish away dry seasons. We can't just hope they fall off. I mean, we can, and we can hope, but it typically isn't going to move the ball anywhere. You know, and we certainly don't want to fall away. Can I get a praise God for that? You know, we don't want to, like, die and have our faith just completely, you know, fall away from us, and we just wander away from the Lord and, you know, seek other ways to feel alive again, right? We, those are not choices we want to run after. I know some of us have gone there, and we would never go back again. And, um, but, but what do we do? So I, I, I want to, so I'm going to give you five specific things um, that we can maybe um, look at or uh, consider, build on in our lives if we're in a dry season. And the first I've already kind of really hinted to, and the first thing we really need to do is this. When you're in a dry season, fix your eyes on Jesus, not the season that you're in. I've given this analogy before, but when I think about that, I just think about, you know, when you're, when you're downhill skiing, the last thing you want to do is worry about the tree on the left that you're going down the hill by, and you don't want to be thinking, I'm going to hit the tree, I'm going to hit the tree, I don't want to hit the tree, you hit the tree. That's what happens when you do that. I think the same thing is true. If all we want to do be is consumed with our problem, consumed with the dry season we're in, and that's all we talk about, all we think about, it's almost like we just keep driving right back into it. So what we want to do is we want to fix our eyes on Jesus and not the dry season that we're in. And, 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 to, and to change our focus, 2 Corinthians 4, um, verses 17 through 18, the Apostle Paul wrote this encouragement. He says, for our present troubles are small and won't last very long, yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles we can see now Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things we, can, we cannot see will last forever. So keep our focus on Christ and Christ alone. We also need to remember that you know, we need to keep our eyes fixed on him because the enemy has a plan for us in this dry season too. God is you know, wanting to spring up something new in us. God is wanting to revive us, restore us. But the enemy's thinking, one more punch and he's out of the match. The enemy's thinking, yeah, I'm going to kick him really hard, and then we're just done. And the enemy wants nothing more than in your moment of spiritual dryness than to steal the very seed of faith from your heart, if he could do that. So we need to remember that we have an enemy. In fact, Paul talks extensively that there's, there's a greater battle going on. Ephesians 6.12, he says, For we're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, against evil spirits in heavenly places, in other words, you know, Paul's like, there's spiritual fireworks going on everywhere around us. You can't see it, but it's happening. And then sometimes the struggle we think is against people and stuff and situations is actually the enemy bringing war against us and bringing war against God's people in such a way as to defeat us if he could do that. So don't give in. Keep your eyes focused on Jesus. Don't, don't get just fixated about your dry season and the problem you're facing and complaining about it and verbalizing it constantly. Fix your eyes on Jesus. The second thing I'm going to encourage you to do is this, and I, I mentioned this briefly earlier, is we also need to, in these moments, recognize our true spiritual condition 
and confront it. You know, if we find ourselves, in, if we've arrived at a very dry and empty place, a spiritually barren place, and the truth of it is we know why, then confront it. Deal with it. Take it out. Don't, don't just wish it away. Don't hope it's going to change. Don't continue to go back to your sin over and over and think, oh, I wish I wouldn't be drawn to this. I wish this wouldn't pull me in. No, confront it. Confess it. Deal with it. You need to act on it. In fact, likely the hinge to you moving out of that dry season or the very thing God's waiting to springboard out of you is a determination to say, no more, I'm drawing the line, I'm not going back, I'm done going to this well, I'm going for the real stuff that God gives to offer. And the moment we decide to finally let go of the sin and cut all the things out of our life that are killing us is the moment really something powerful springs up within all of us. So we need to recognize that spiritual condition in front of, and, and confront it. John wrote this in 1 John 1, 9, he says, If we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. James, he, he would write and he, he, he talked about powerful and effective prayer and he talked about healing. And, and in James chapter 5, verse 15, he said, Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be what? Healed. That we be healed. Confession. We see God works in confession. When we confess, when we repent, then the floodgates of healing and restoration can begin to move in our hearts and lives as we begin to let go. But we have to confront it. So if we're in a dry season and we know we're spiritually dying on the inside, we need to say, you know what, Lord? And we need to say to a friend, we need to say to uh, an elder, a leader, someone that loves us, that's going to pray for us. I am struggling, and I'm wrestling with sin, and I'm dealing with just all sorts of terrible thoughts and issues. I want to confess that because I need the Lord to show up and change my heart. We confront it. We take it on, and then we pray and, and ask that God would heal us and restore us. We confess our sins to each other and pray for each other that we might be healed. So we re recognize our spiritual condition and confront it. The third thing I'm going to give you is this, is we would seek the Lord fervently and worship the Lord passionately. What am I saying in this? When you're in a dry season, it's not the time to coast. You're going to feel like that. You're going to feel like, well, you know, kind of wheels up. We're just going to kind of move along here. You know, just a cruising speed. It's going to be fine. I don't know what else to do. No, it, it's not the time to let up. It's not the time to coast. It's not the time to shrink back. It's time to dig in. It's time to dig in. In Matthew 7, 7 through 8, there's this idea that there's a, a continually pressing in on, on these matters. Uh, what we see is Jesus says, keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the prayer will be open to you. For everyone who asks, receive. Everyone who seeks, finds. And to everyone who knocks, the door will be open. And obviously Jesus, he's, he's teaching and talking about prayer, but there's an idea of pressing in when we, when we aren't able to immediately see that which we need in our life. We don't just like give up and throw in the towel and, and call it quits. We push in. We keep on seeking. We keep on asking. We keep on knocking until we receive and until the door is open, right? That's what we do. We keep on pressing in. Uh, Luke 10 uh, verse 27, and Jesus talking about the greatest commandment, he says, you must love the Lord your God with, look at that, I want you to, there's so much here, but look what he says here, all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind, right? There's an idea that we're all in, we're not holding back, we're not going to, you know, because we're feeling a little dry and empty, we're not going to like kind of, again, begin to coast and only give give half effort, oh, I just don't feel it, I'm just not feeling it, so we don't, we, no, we continue, even in these moments, we, we go through the practice, we pour ourselves out, we give everything we have, the best we know to do, with all of my heart, all of my mind, all of my soul, all of my strength, to the best of my ability, even when I don't feel like it. Remember what we said in the first week? One of the issues we have with these dry seasons is they're guided so much by what we feel, but not very much at all by what is true. The truth of it is, God doesn't leave us. He didn't forsake you. Your dry season you're in, God didn't abandon you. He, 
is the same yesterday, today, and forever. However, we do change. And, and things do need to happen in our lives, and then other things happen to us in lives, right? These things happen, and so we need to continue to push all in because God is right there. We, we love the Lord our God with all of our heart, our soul, our mind, our strength. We don't let up. Romans 12, 11, I love this, and I think it can fit here. We are encouraged to never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. And I love Eugene Peterson and, and the message. I love the color he, he adds to this. He says, uh, don't burn out. Keep yourselves fueled and aflame. Be alert, servants of the master, cheerfully expectant. Don't quit in hard times. Pray all the harder. That's what he gives us for advice. I'll thank you, Paul, for that. And all of this, which emphasizes the fourth thing I want to share is this, is that we would persist in healthy, in spiritual formation and habits. That we would persist in them. Again, it's not the time to let off the gas. What does Galatians 9 tell us? What did Paul teach those in, in the city? He said, let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't what? If we give up. So, if we give up, what can we expect? Nothing. But the trouble is, a lot of times when we enter a dry season, that's exactly what we do. We're stuck. We feel a little dead. We feel lifeless. We feel cold. I felt nothing during worship. I got nothing out of reading my Bible today. And so, what do we often do? We give up. We resign for a while. Take a break. Uh, Maybe I'll feel like it again next week. Maybe next month. Well, maybe at Christmas I'll get the tingle back. Whatever the tingle is. Right? You know, because again, we're so driven by what we feel. We got to feel something. But God's calling us to walk in truth. And the knowledge of what we cannot see. And the faith in what we cannot see. It's a, it's a trust all the way through. And so we're encouraged. Don't get, don't, go, don't get tired of doing what's good. At just the right time... There comes a harvest. There comes, there comes a response. There comes growth. There comes new life if we don't give up. But if we give up, how are we ever going to see a change? How's it ever going to happen? The psalmist, Psalm 18, verse 25, he declared, you know, our God's the kind of God to, that to the faithful, he shows himself faithful. Come on, somebody. And so we want to walk in faithfulness. So, so what are we going to do? We're going to pray like we've never prayed before when we're in a dry season. So what are we going to do in a dry season? We're going to read God's Word like we've never read it before. We're going to go after learning His Word. We're going to study His Word like we never have before. We're going to go further, not shallower. We're going to go deeper. You know, um, we're going to serve like we've never served before. We're going to minister to people, even if it's out of what feels like our emptiness, but God's fullness. We're going to serve and we're going to give. We're we're going to be generous like never before. We're not going to, in a dry season, just close our hands and hold everything to ourselves and not, not allow to God to bless others through us. We're going to be, allow ourselves to be used more by God in that, that situation. We're going to trust like we've never trusted before. We're going to work like we've never worked before. We're going to hope like we've never uh, hoped before. We're going to worship like we've never worshipped before. And when it's time, we're going to Sabbath like we're, we've never Sabbathed before. We're going to be more committed, not less committed. We're going to gather more often, not less often. We're going to fast. We're going to disciple. We're going to study, lead, whatever it is. Here's what we're going to do, church. We're going to persist. We're going to push on. We're going to push in. We're not going to let the dry season take us out. We're going to let God come and revive us at the end of the day. I can't tell you when does this refreshing come. I can't promise you that, hey, after you do these things and for such a period of time, God's just going to, and you're just going to come to life. It's different for everybody, and you're in your season for reasons I can't even possibly understand, but God knows. And I do trust him that in due season, when we don't give up, God's refreshing indeed does come to us. So don't pull back. Don't let off the gas. Don't coast haphazardly. I'm not going to wait until I feel good or feel God before I run after, run hard after my good God. Somebody say amen to that, right? I just made that up. That's good. I'm writing that down, right? Um, I'm going to trust that God is with me, not what I feel, but what I know to be true. And the fifth thing is this, and I'm going to invite the worship team if you come back up. 
The fifth thing is this. Pray for and expect supernatural provision. You're going to need it. You don't make it through desert experiences without the very sustenance that will keep you alive. But here's the promise. God provides. If he send ravens to carry food to his, to his beloved and, and, and moments and, and restore them by strength, he will bring you what you need to get through the season. It may feel like the bare necessity, but I do know this. God sustains those he loves. You will have what you need. So pray for and expect supernatural provision along the way we can do that. Psalm 37, 7 says this, Be still in the presence of the Lord. And look at this, and wait patiently for Him to act. Don't worry about evil people who prosper or fret about their wicked schemes. Psalm 5, 3 says, Listen to my voice in the morning, uh, Lord. Each morning I bring my request to you and wait, what does it say? Expectantly. We're going to wait expectantly. Matthew 7 again, 7 through 8. I want to read this one once again. What do we do? There's an expectation here, right? Keep on asking, and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking, and you will find. Keep on knocking, and the door will be open to you. Everyone who asks, receive. Everyone who seeks, finds. To everyone who knocks, the door will be open. So, what am I trusting for in my life? You know, it's easy to think that because I'm up here speaking a message like this, well, I must not have anything in, like what you're going through. I must not be in any sort of dry season church. Can I just tell you, it has been a long, hard, dry season in my life. But I always, you know, even in the moments where I feel like quitting, I have to ask myself the question of, well, what does it look like if I quit? There's nothing attractive or good or helpful or, or of good report out of, of just quitting. I'm just giving up on it all. I don't want anything that looks like that outcome. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to persist. I'm going to push in. I'll even adopt the mantra. I'll fake it till I make it, baby. I'm not trying to fake it per se, but I'm going to go through the motions. I'm going to continue to exercise the spiritual formation and the discipline and the things I know that ultimately connect me to my Father. Because if I, if I get disconnected from the vine, then I have no hope of being restored again. But just because I'm up here, doesn't mean that I've got you know, the, the, the path paved and it's easy and I don't know what a dry, I know what a dry season looks like. So I'm here to declare, if you're in a dry season too, come on, let's, let's, let's walk together. Let's, let's trust God for what's on the other side of what feels like dry seasons because they come and they go. And when you're in one, boy, oh, they're hard. But we can move through them because we have a God who brings rivers to the desert. Come on. A God that brings rivers to a desert. And we'll give Him thanks when that water pours oh so freely into all areas of our lives. So, I know that um, last week there was a great response to the call to come and rest and lay things down. And, but today, I, I want to, as we wrap this series up, I want to invite you to come also again today. And this is going to take for some of you a lowering of your pride because, you know, you, you're worried about maybe what people see or think. I mean, you need to stop worrying about what people think of you. And you need to start thinking about your relationship with the Father and, and, and what you would do for Him because He's done an awful lot for all of us. And, and today, my goal isn't to embarrass anyone or draw attention to anyone, but I, in a moment here, as we sing this song again, if you feel dry and empty or you just, maybe you're coming out of a season or maybe you just want God to gird you up because, you know, you know a season could come. Whatever is going on today, if you have a need that needs met, I want to invite you to come up front and just stand around. We call this the altar area. I know it's just like a stage and there's no like altery thing looking here, but I've also found kneeling right here is a nice little altar. But I want you to encourage you to come and um, we're going to sing, uh, we're going to proclaim what some of us feel and that's, Lord, my cup is empty. Would you fill it to overflowing? And I'm believing that today God's going to begin to water some of your souls today. I think God's going to begin to bring refreshing and breakthrough, but will we persist? Will we push through to see it? 
So I'm going to invite everyone to stand to your feet today. And if you're home, I know that maybe you feel disconnected from this moment some way. But right there in your living room, I want to encourage you. Maybe, maybe you stand, maybe you turn around on the couch and make an altar for yourself there. But I want to encourage you to take a moment and allow God to speak to you today. First of all, if you're here and you'd say, you know, Pastor, I, I don't even know if I'm a Christian, to be honest with you. I, I don't really know what it is to follow Christ. I've not really been connected to Him in a way that I, I think would be life-giving. And, and you'd say, Pastor, today I want to make a decision to really truly follow Jesus. I'm not, I don't want to dabble anymore. I don't want to just test the water. I, I don't want to keep running back to the old things that used to fill me. I, I really want God's filling on my life. I really want His plans for me, His purposes for me, the life that only He can give. And you say, Pastor, today I want to start a relationship with Jesus, or I want to restart that relationship. I want to invite you to bow your heads right now at this time and close your eyes. And if you'd say, if you're in the room today, you'd say, Pastor, that's me. I want to pick back up on my journey of following Jesus, or I want to get started today. Would you just lift your hand right up where you're at? Because I want to pray for you if that's anyone today. Anyone today? Thank you, thank you, thank you. I want to pray for you, and um, I want to pray for all of us. But Lord, right now, I just want to thank you for those who would say, I want you, Lord. I want you, Jesus. I want to be your follower. I want to be your son. I want to be your daughter. I want to know what it is to be in a loving relationship with a God who wants to refresh my life. I exchange my sin for your grace. And I ask you to help me to go a whole new direction with my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. to Overflow that I might be full of you and all my old self emptied out. I'm hungry to experience your renewing and restoration. In the name of Jesus, come into my life. And I thank you for it right now. Thank you, Jesus. Could we give just a hand of uh, just encouragement for those who prayed like that just now? Thank you, Lord. The angels celebrate every time a name is added to the Lamb's Book of Life. And and now I want to encourage you, if you need prayer today, if you just want to be filled in these few moments before we break and do some fun stuff, let's just not miss this opportunity today. So I invite you to come. We're going to sing here in just a moment. Come and just fill the front if you would, or come and kneel where you'd like. But let's just invite the Lord to fill us up and fill our cups. Amen. Lord, right now I just want to lift up my friends and family that have all gathered here and whether they're kneeling or standing at the front or in their seats, their hearts and hands are extended and Lord, we all desire for just a rich filling of your spirit and presence in our lives. Refresh us, God. Bring the rain in our lives where we are dry and empty. Refresh your kids today. Renew their strength, God, as they turn to you, as they pour themselves out to you, Lord, I pray they would just be able to walk forward in a confidence knowing, not, it may not be about feeling at this point, but knowing that you are good and you have good plans for them. And Lord, you're going to see them through this dry, dry season. And we look forward to the new growth and the new life. And Lord, for those of us that maybe can't see it, help us to perceive it. Help us to see what you see and to to, to have a vision for what you, you want for our lives. And I just pray that right now, God, we would trust you with the details. We may not know how we're going to come through the current thing, but we do know we can trust you. We do know that there is a reward and harvest and, and a restoration and refreshing that is on the other side waiting for us. And I'm grateful that ultimately, at the end of this life, we're going to be restored and refreshed in a way that we couldn't even imagine as we experience the fullness of your kingdom together. I want to thank you, God, for this body of believers, those you brought in today. Connect us, knit us together in this special community. Help us to encourage one another. Help us to pray for one another and really, really look after one another. Fill us to overflow, we pray just give you all the thanks and all the praise that God's people said. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. It's okay if you want to